Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just did my prediction redo, kind of mid-season prediction redo. A lot of ones that I feel okay about. There's a lot of cra craziness going on in college football, so saying anything with your chest right about now feels a little bit irresponsible, but I got some crazy ones in there. If you want to go check that out, you're more than welcome in. Definitely come after me in the comments because there's some in there that I'm sure people will not love. But let's get into some players and some coaches that are under a big time microscope as we head into this upcoming weekend because there are a lot of them, but they're not necessarily all from those big games. While there are a lot from those big games, but there are a couple that I kind of want to get to that are a little bit more off the beaten path. But let's start with one of those huge games. Kalen DeBoer is under a huge amount of pressure this week. I think this goes without saying, frankly it's going to go until the end of the year with him because can you imagine Bama fans if they have two losses before the end of October? That would be an insane thing for them to see, would be something that they are not remotely accustomed to feeling, and I think it would come back on Kalen DeBoer pretty aggressively. Now, here's the hard part of this. They're not necessarily playing a team where it's kind of a layup of a game. You're walking into a Tennessee environment where it's going to be absolutely on fire. Your team lost the last time they were there. Well, not your team, but Alabama lost the last time they were there, so Tennessee knows that they can do this. They definitely have some questions on the offensive side of the ball for Tennessee, but you have a lot of questions on the defensive side of the ball. So it's going to be really interesting to watch this one unfold, and I think the other part of this is the Tennessee defense is a nightmare to deal with, and Kalen DeBoer is going to have to be able to get some guys open. In. Sounds like Kobe Prentice and Kendrick Law could not be going in this game, which adds that even more. So there's a lot going into this one. He's going to have to put on a really, really good game plan. And then obviously Nick Sheridan's going to have to call an incredible game. And then on top of all of that, all due respect to Vanderbilt, they did an incredible job in that game but they beat them on the field. This is the first real SEC at road atmosphere that he is going to play in. No disrespect to Vanderbilt again. The reality was the football is what won them that game, not necessarily the atmosphere of Vanderbilt. So a really, really incredible atmosphere he's walking into. He's coached in great atmospheres, and he gave Tennessee fans a little bit of billboard material because of that. But at the end of the day, he's walking into a madhouse, and he's got to be able to get a win. I think if he does not get this win, I think there's a lot of questions about um, – I don't think there should be a lot of questions. I want to make that very, very clear from the jump. I don't think there should be too many questions about the future there, but let's be honest. Bama fans will absolutely have those questions. In this game as well, Nico Iamaliava just has to play better football going forward. There is not a world where Tennessee does what they want to do, goes to the SEC title, goes to the CFP, it possibly competes for a title, if this guy is not playing really well, he has to be able to kick it up a notch towards the end of the season. And you're t facing a Bama back end that there's going to be openings to be had. You've missed a couple of openings in the past couple of weeks, but there will be a world where you're going to have open receivers running. Can you hit them? Can you make those big plays? And can you kind of stamp yourself on college football this season? Because this could be a huge turning point for your team that feels like they're kind of reeling right now. And then the last couple of weeks, you know, you're missing those huge passes. You have the tough uh, Arkansas result. And there's a number of different ways where both those results, you could have flipped the Arkansas result. You could have had a much more comfortable win against Florida, gone into this feeling like you were a national title contender. Just a couple of shots. It's just a couple of big plays that he is, <clears throat> excuse me, that he has missed over the last couple of days, he very badly needs to hit those on Saturday. So I think he's a very, very talented, capable kid. There's no two ways about that. You see the way he throws the football. It's a lot of just, I, whether it's lack of confidence, whether it's lack of execution, I don't know. But at the end of the day, he is missing the balls that he very much needs to hit, and he could rewrite the book on Saturday. He could totally subside all of those worries. If they beat Alabama, I promise you, there's not a Tennessee fan in the world that's saying anything bad about Nico Imaliava at the end of the night. This is a kind of interesting one. I think Jack Tuttle's in an interesting spot because Michigan has made their quarterback change. It is going to be Jack Tuttle the rest of the way this season. The question is, how much of a flip are Michigan fans expecting from this offense? Because I know they want a flip. They want to be able to pass the ball a little bit more often. I don't think they're expecting to be, you know, a pass-first team by any stretch of the imagination. But I do think they're expecting a little bit more from that game. The question is, do they go back to just what they were doing with Davis Warren? Because I think Jack Tuttle can open up a, even a little bit more than Davis Warren did. Do they play just, we're going to run the ball and then just take our shots the same way they did with Alex Orgy, but hopefully hit those shots 
spots a little bit more often. It'll be really interesting to see how they kind of approach this game with Jack Tuttle, but this is a talented kid. I feel very confident that he is someone that can elevate this offense at least a little bit. More than anything else, I think you get Colston Loveland involved, and frankly, that is the very best offensive player that uh, Michigan has. You could argue Khalil Mullings or Donovan Edwards. I'd say Colston Loveland is an absolute game changer, and they very badly need him in the offense. So he's one of those guys that I think Michigan fans are going into this weekend expecting to win that game, expecting to look a lot better on offense, and expecting to walk out of it saying, you know, maybe we're not going to have that elite season, go to the CFP, but we now have a quarterback that we can feel confident in and at least play competent, uh, competent football and maybe just maybe compete with Oregon and Ohio State down the road. I don't necessarily expect all of that to happen, but I do think Jack Total has quite the spotlight on him just to subside some worries for some Michigan fans going forward. And then we got Shadur Sanders. This is another little bit of a different situation, but Shadur Sanders going out the rest of the season has pressure on him. Frankly, he wakes up with pressure on him just because he is Dion's son. He is the face of a program that not a lot of people like. That is no secret to him. That's no secret to really anyone out there. But the reality is, another piece of this is, Travis Hunter, Jimmy Horn Jr., they are coming back into the fold this upcoming weekend. How close are they to 100% is a big-time question. And Travis Hunter, do they lean more towards taking him out of some offensive snaps so he can play some more defensive snaps because that's probably where they're going to need him in this game. So it's going to be interesting to watch this one. He's more than capable of stepping up to the plate because we've seen him step up to the plate. He's been asked to do a ton for a really, really long time every single place he's been in college football. But the reality is it's going to be a little bit more pressure on him. It's going to be a little bit more energy on him and really more energy on this entire college. Colorado team. They know now that they're on thin ice if they want to be able to reach their goals of going to a Big 12 title and being a big time contender in this league. They're going to have to win this one and they're going to have to continue winning pretty much the rest of the way if they want to be in Arlington. So this guy has all the pressure in the world on him. He's answered the bell pretty much every time that he's had. So I'm not necessarily super worried that he's going to miss the mark, but the reality still stands. It's going to be a battle the rest of the season and he's going to have a lot on his shoulders the rest of the way. Lincoln Riley's in a weird spot here as well because it's not necessarily a marquee game. They're going to play Maryland, right? Not necessarily a huge deal by any means, but there's been a lot of scrutiny about the last couple of games, a couple of clock mismanagement, and I talked about the one at the end of the Penn State game. One of the crazier things that I've ever seen, I'll be totally honest with you. But the funny thing is here, I still think he has time at this job. The weird thing about the situation around Lincoln Riley is, no, they're not playing good football. They're not doing what they want to do this season. They also just hired the, the defensive coordinator that, that they probably should have hired to start with, to be totally fair. So that is on Lincoln Riley. I'm not necessarily taking pressure off him for making that bad hire, but it is to say, you know, he is in his third, fourth year as the coach of USC. He's probably in his first year of this kind of rebuild of USC, which is a hard pill to swallow for a lot of different reasons. But the reality is, none of that changes the fact that he very much has to deliver. If they lose to Maryland this upcoming weekend, lose three straight, the future of Lincoln Riley at USC, at the very least, is going to get a little bit hairy. I don't think it's going to get, you know, the, the you know, I don't think there's people calling for, a, for his head, although there will be people. Those people are probably the minority. I do think there is ability to say, you know, if they lose this one, if they go through the rest of the schedule just looking like the weaker, more less physical team, there will be people asking the question of, can Lincoln Riley ever get to that point of having that physical team? And I think he'll probably get 2025. I'm not necessarily worried about him getting fired. I am just worried about the perception around him going forward if he does not win this game this upcoming weekend. And then we'll get back into the big games. Kirby Smart, this is a huge one. No two ways about that. And there's obviously all that scrutiny around him and the Michael Van Buren incident. I won't necessarily get into that. I got into that earlier in the week. But he's got a huge game on his hands. And he's in a position where he hasn't really been in for quite some time. You know, losing a game uh, in the regular season hadn't happened since 2020, I believe, when they played South Carolina. So quite some time ago. But the reality is... Now he's got to win this one. They know that they're on kind of uh, thin ice a little bit. I think they can lose and still make the CFP, but the reality is with Tennessee and Ole Miss still on that schedule, you got to be careful. You got to be able to execute in this one and possibly get this win. And the other part of this is look at the offense on the other side. It's an absolute nightmare to keep up with all of the speed, all of the weapons. Quinn Ewers handling that offense really, really well. Obviously not so well last week, but I 
tend to believe he's going to be totally back to normal and be the Quinn Ewers that we've become accustomed to. So how do you handle that? It's him against Steve Sarkeesian in a lot of ways, and we'll see what happens. One of the best matchups that we'll see all year when it comes to coaching or in play calling. So it's going to be incredible to watch this one. I think the biggest one for me in this game is this Georgia team has never lacked a chip on their shoulder, at least in the past, and feels like this one does just a little bit to me. They could totally prove me wrong on Saturday, though. If they go down there, they get a big-time win in Austin. This team has every uh, every bit of the chip on their shoulder as, as, they, as other teams have had in the past, and Kirby Smart is doing exactly what he usually does, which is set, him, uh, set his team up to possibly make a little bit of a title run. And then we'll go to his quarterback. Carson Beck has been playing really good football over the last couple of weeks, and obviously everyone goes back to the first half of that Alabama game where it did not look crisp, or that uh, uh, Kentucky game where he was very much out of rhythm. This kid can throw, uh, can sling the pill. He is absolutely incredible to watch throwing the football, and frankly, he's in one of these moments where a lot can happen on Saturday. And not only can his team get back into the CFP race, get back into the title race, get back into the SEC race, he could possibly find his way into the Heisman race. I know that sounds crazy, but we saw with Dylan Gabriel last week, a a guy that was playing good, not great football, has one big time game and shoots up to the top. I think that could be the same thing for Carson Beck. And probably the added piece to this is I don't know how many NFL scouts will be in the crowd. I wouldn't be surprised if it was in the triple digits. This is going to be a dream for NFL scouts. When you watch, when you see Kelvin Banks and Carson Beck and Quinn Ewers and Isaiah Bond and Anthony Hill and a million other guys on that field. It's going to be incredible to watch this. So this could be the moment where he locks up that number one overall pick. I still think this is a guy that when you get him to the NFL level is going to be probably the most prolific of the group at uh, at the college level right now. If he does really, really good things on Saturday, I think there's going to be a lot of NFL scouts calling their GM saying this is number one. Do not even think about it. And then this guy could do the exact same thing. Quinn Ewers is in a very interesting spot because the reality is he did not play very well against Oklahoma. He would be the very first to tell you that, left a lot on the table. And frankly, I think some of that was rust. I think some of that was Oklahoma does a very, very good job of disguising pressures, of disguising coverages, and it got him a little bit early on in that game. He totally settled in, played really good football towards the end, and I think he's going to be more than fine in this game. You know, when you talk about Quinn Ewers and big-time games, He steps up to the plate. There's no two ways about that. Has beaten Alabama on the road. Has beaten Michigan on the road. Is 2-1 in those games against uh, OU. Has obviously gone to the CFP and won a Big 12 title. So those big-time games, you tend to get the best of Quinn Ewers in. I don't necessarily expect anything different. I think this is one that he has circled for quite some time. One of the best defensive teams that he's faced on uh, this entire year. And I think they're right around where Michigan and OU is. Kind of hard to rank those defenses. They're all, I think, very good. I think Georgia's big problem is in the back end. We'll see if uh, Texas can take advantage of that. But there's a lot on the table for both these quarterbacks. Both these quarterbacks, frankly, could be walking out of this thing feeling pretty good about them being the number one overall pick or the other one be walking out feeling like you know where am I going to go in the NFL draft so a lot on the table this upcoming weekend but beyond the NFL draft obviously this is for the SEC this is for the CFP berth this is for maybe the best team in the country cannot wait for that game it's going to be so much fun and those two quarterbacks are going to be at the very center of that thing but let's take our second break here and when we come back we got a couple of games to get on your radar we got a couple that have already happened throughout this week including one team getting a win in a first win in a very long time, but I'll get to that right after this, so stick with us.